YouTube channel after the event. We're delighted to have everybody here. We've got another great set of speakers uh, uh, joining us. Uh, my name is Henrietta Wilson, um, and I'm really pleased to be part of this project along with Dan Plesh and Alama Day Samuel. Um, and I'm very grateful to Julia Alf Brinker for helping with the technical aspects of today's webinar. Um, so it's going to follow a similar format to the other webinars uh, we've had. We've got three fantastic speakers. Um, we've got Joseph Byrne from RUSI, Alama Day Samuel from SOAS and Scrap Weapons. We're also hoping to have Faya Lezhnevska, um, but what you might have overheard just now was there being some technical difficulties with connecting her. Unfortunately, the fourth speaker that we'd hoped to have today, um, Joseph Dubé, is unable to be with us, uh, unfortunately. Um, he's been enormously helpful uh, to other parts of this project, and I hope that he might be able to join us at a later time. He comes from uh, various different contexts in South Africa, and it's always really useful to us to capture different geographical and sectorial approaches in these webinars. Um, but thank you. Thank you to him. Thank you to the other speakers and thank you to everybody for joining us. Um, before I introduce, before I hand over to the speakers, I'm going to quickly say a few words about where we're at uh, with this uh, seminar, with this webinar series. I'm going to start by sharing a, a slide um, so that I can... Uh, Oops, I haven't done that quite right. Sorry about that. I shouldn't talk and do this at the same time. Uh... Great, thank you for bearing with me on that. So just to recap where we're at with webinars. We're thinking about open source verification and we've got an extremely wide uh, definition for this. We're thinking about any monitoring that takes place using publicly available tools and information. So what that looks like are systems that capture uh, data via satellite or via social media and use various automated or manual analytical skips tools for processing and analyzing that data. It also looks like people on the ground carefully collecting information through trusted networks of people. Um, it also looks at projects that are scanning the internet for uh, publications via traditional media, print media, broadcast media, anything like that. So open source verification means a lot of different stuff and there's a lot of different projects happening all around the world to do with it. So the purpose of this webinar series is really simply to capture some of that variety. We're not going to do the whole lot, but we want to be able to capture um, the varieties of things that are going on with the recognition that new technologies have completely changed the sorts of people that are able to do this and the sorts of functionalities we can capture with this. So in the past, the ability to monitor or see different things around the world was really the domain of governments with their intelligence capturing services or international organizations who have verification regimes tied to particular international treaties. But nowadays, there's a whole different scale of visibility made possible by technological components. So we're interested in looking at that. Um, we're interested in the non-governmental approaches to this and the governmental approaches to this and, and, and ways of which it's being used within go governance, uh, global governance systems. Um, so within the scrap team at SOAS, we're also thinking about other ways of making this more are there ways of harnessing it in different ways? Are there challenges implicit in this work? Um, in particular, we've been thinking about global tracking systems. Is it possible? Is it desirable to set up a global weapons tracking system? Is it desirable or possible to do more in the field of environmental monitoring worldwide? Um, so thank you. That's just a brief snapshot of the sort of things we've been interested in uh, through this series. Um, and how this webinar is going to work now, um, as I said, it's the fourth webinar in a series and follows a very similar format. We'll have three short talks, um, uh, one from somebody engaged in a monitoring project and two from analysts thinking about the wider significance of open source verification. Uh, throughout the talks, I invite everybody uh, to make comments on what they're listening to or ask questions to the speakers. Um, 
and if you could do that via the chat function while the talks are going on and I will harvest them and put them to the speakers and um, please do give your name and affiliation if you can um, and then from three o'clock um, the presentation We'll be keeping the Zoom space open for an optional 30 minutes for a breakout discussion. We found in the past there's more to say than the first hour allows us for. Um, so we keep, we keep the webinar space open for that time. So thank you all for being with me. Uh, I'm now going to ha ha hand over to Joseph Byrne. Uh, thank you very much, Joseph. Uh, thanks, Henrietta. I'm just going to share my screen here. And also, apologies, I'm going to uh, just uh, turn off my video because um, the internet is not, not the best. There we go. Um, so, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks, thanks again, Henrietta, for um, inviting me to speak. Uh, this webinar series has had some really excellent uh, people in the field speak about their work, so I'm, I'm very, very happy to, to speak about mine. Um, very, very briefly, uh, my name is Joe Byrne. I work at the Royal United Services Institute on Whitehall, and um, I'm in the proliferation nuclear policy team. And within that, I work on a project called Project Sandstone, uh, which looks at researching and investigating uh, North Korean illicit networks. Uh, so, in the context and the subject of this webinar, we're mainly looking at sanctions evasion activity and the proliferation angle. Uh, so, at Project Sandstone, we're looking to generate uh, open source chains of information and evidence that can create actionable intelligence uh, that would be useful for entities that are looking to support the enforcement of, of UN Security Council resolutions against North Korea. And what you said actually earlier, Henrietta, was interesting because about the scalability of, uh, and the transferability of these, uh, these methods. And, I believe what we do here can be transferred to lots of different aspects. Um, we have a methodology and you know, this could be used for lots of different uh, use cases, but we, mainly, we focus specifically on, on North Korea. So just a little, little bit of background about why, why the project, how the project came about and why we're doing it. Um, it mainly focuses on North Korean illicit shipping. Uh, as I said before, it was an extensive uh, sanctions regime against the DPRK. Uh, which really ticked up in the 216-217 period and a lot of those sanctions fo focused on the maritime aspects of um, North Korea's illicit activity. And while in the past that uh, we may have seen possibly North Korea exporting full missile systems such as SCUDs or uh, you know, MiG parts, um, there have been instances of those transfers, um, but we're, we're probably, because of the sanctions, less likely to see that now for systems being shipped and more likely to see exports of illegal commodities um, banned under the resolution such as coal or imports of um, commodities such as uh, petroleum. And really to, to assess these activities uh, what we're looking to do is fuse a large amount of data together. Um, we try and use a wide range of open source data streams from satellite imagery in its different forms to shipping databases to mapping tools and corporate records. We have a, a wide pool of uh, information that we try and draw from. Some of it is open source, completely open source free, and some of it is, is paid for. Um, but this gives us the ability to understand how these vessels behave, what they're doing, and also to map their ownership structures and, uh, and the chains of accountability for illicit activity that's, that we possibly see occurring. And so, in in this in this pro on this project, I specifically focus on the geo inside. We have uh, my my colleagues, my very very talented colleagues, uh, have lots of different specialist areas, and we have specific language skills and and other and other um, aspects. But I mainly focus on satellite imagery, geo and uh, AIS transmissions, and anything uh, any geospatial data that you can that you can pull together. And satellite imagery is the main the main uh, thing we think about when I think of you know geospatial data um, is it's really vital for our work to provide chains of evidence and eyes on the ground so to, so to speak um, of, uh, of images of specific vessels and corroboration of um, other data such as AIS or uh, um, other information provided 
in open source literature, such as UN Panel of Experts reports. And with this, we can provide chains of evidence from the different data sources. So, you know, when you have a satellite image, you, you, you know, you, you can analyze that and see which vessels are present, um, you know, if a ship is transmitting on a certain signal, uh, if that ship is who, is who it says it is, uh, which is a, uh, very common in the North Korean case where a lot of vessels transmit on anomalous AIS signals. And so we really tried to branch out our capabilities and we don't just use optical imagery, which is kind of the full color images that you see in the top right hand side of, of the uh, slide. Uh, but we also try and use other data sources such as synthetic aperture radar, um, which is a, it's just an amazing tool. Um, and it shoots at times when other satellites can't shoot uh, due to light conditions and it can also see through cloud um, and it is available open source. And then additionally, further trying to branch out into other new areas of, um, of tracking vessels such as radio frequency geolocation, uh, that is much less, uh, it's harder to get in the, in the open source at the minute, but there, you know, there's new companies coming up all the time with different innovative solutions. And so like I was saying before, really what this all pulls into is kind of the geospatial intelligence, um, some, some would say. And it's, all that basically means is you know, putting geospatial data, imagery, uh, coordinate data, and, and layering it all together to provide a product or to provide a, a chain of evidence. And you can see on the, on the right hand side, uh, we, use, we use mapping software to overlay different data sources, you know, from satellite imagery to AIS, uh, SAR, and any kind of data sources we can get our, our hands on. This specifically was uh, an image that we found of a North Korean vessel uh, conducting a possible transfer with a, a Chinese flag vessel. And what you can see on the, on the top, top right hand corner there is the AIS of, of both vessels. And what you can see is there is that if you have a piece of evidence, you can go back to where that vessel came from, where, um, where they've been, and you can do all sorts of data manipulation and, and assessing where these vessels came from and, and the chains how they got there. In this specific case, uh, the North Korean vessel, we got another image of it loading coal a couple of days before, and then we got a very low resolution image um, of the other vessel in the Chinese port. Um, that's not to say, you know, it wasn't, uh, the low resolution image isn't a complete, um, uh, you know, it didn't fully let us know that the, the vessel was transmitting there and it, uh, delivered the commodities there, but it, it let us, it's corroborating data for other data sources. And especially when we look at so many vessels and especially when we're looking at satellite imagery, we try and have a rigorous uh, methodology for looking at uh, vessels in satellite imagery. So we've tried to identi identify loads of vessels um, from satellite imagery. And we have, a, as I said, a, a try and have a rigorous methodology using lots of different data sources such as uh, um, maritime databases, open source imagery, uh, open source reporting, such as UN panel reports and, and loads of different aspects of that. But when you get into the really high resolution imagery, you can measure the vessels in uh, geospatial uh, software. We, we use QGIS, which is uh, quantum geospatial intelligence. Um, and it's a free open source state, um, free open source platform which you can use and, and plot coordinate data in. And it's really powerful, has loads of different uses, and it's kind of the, the industry standard for the open source on GIS systems. And this is really important for us for monitoring North Korean illicit shipping activity because lots of vessels, uh, especially when they're conducting illicit activity, they don't transmit on their um, actual identifiers, anomalous AIS signals. Um, in a few of our previous reports we've reported on uh, anomalous AIS and using satellite imagery uh, confirmed identity of, of vessels that were conducting illicit activity. So really when you're looking at this sort of activity uh, it's really important to have a, that imagery and that, that, um, that eyes on data. And so, and so using these, these, this methodology there's, there's loads of different applications you know monitoring sanctions evasion, um, investigating vessels of interest and um, even mapping these illicit networks once you, you know, have vessels of interest that you, can, um, that you want to look into. Uh, 
in March, we, we released a, a piece of the New York Times on uh, how coronavirus, well, how we thought coronavirus was idling a lot of these North Korean ships. And you can see on the right hand side, this is a, a synthetic, synthetic aperture radar image of the, the anchorage at one of the, the main ports in North Korea. And we just saw an, an explosion of vessels anchored there. Like, and many that I've never seen a, a grounding like that before. So it was monitoring this activity. You can really see trends and um, it supplements the information that's on the ground. And so then, apart from the geospatial side, we also look at mapping these entities and mapping the companies behind these entities and vessels. Um, we, uh, we have a, a large database of uh, North Korean vessels and the people that own them. And it's just uh, an amazing tool for looking at typologies and red flags and and very often lots of these vessels cross over um, or ownership structures cross over and they're used uh, over time and um, we've we've written several reports on on the network mapping and, and how we look at that we use a custom ontology in a platform called Multigo uh, so we database information in that and it is free and open source um, until you get to I think 10,000 entities and then you have to start paying for a subscription but that's another really, really great tool for database information and mapping networks. And moving on from that, you know, these techniques can be used in, in lots of different instances. Um, you know, illicit networks, are not just uh, specific to North Korea. There's you know lots of different uh, aspects that you can use this for. Um, uh, national security or you know, policing work. That's another very uh, common use of multi-go and mapping software. But what this what this really kind of points to is that open source data is becoming a lot more uh, is readily available and the cost is decreasing, especially in the cases of satellite imagery or and new tools are being uh, created all the time. So it's it's kind of about keeping up and finding the new things that are out there, but it's becoming more and more accessible to conduct these kind of investigations. And here is just a few examples of of the the work that myself and the team uh, I work with have done. Uh, this crosses over from shipping, uh, looking at networks that provide uh, flags to North Korean vessels, uh, anomalous AIS, uh, even there was a, a case of UK companies owning North Korean ships that were um, busting sanctions, which is quite topical considering the FinCEN papers. And uh, then we were looking at um, large scale breaches of uh, sanctions in Chinese waters, um, many North Korean vessels. And then our latest report moved away from the maritime section. I looked at lots of trade data, which is based in the city of uh, Dandong in China. So that was a, a really quick rip, <laughs> rip through. I, I tried to keep it to 10 minutes, but um, I'm very happy to answer any questions. And, and thank you very much for, for listening. Thank you very much, Joe. What an amazing uh, encapsulation of the power of some of these tools, the, the kind of level of detail that you can get uh, uh, from applying the methodologies that you outline. Um, you've picked up on all sorts of things that echo things, I think, that have been points that have been made in previous webinars. Um, I like your, your, your phrase that you're collecting chains of evidence, that there's no kind of single uh, you're tracking down one thing and then that gives you a slam dunk proof of something, but you're kind of coordinating different uh, data streams. Um, and this really is reminiscent of um, a talk we had from Akled uh, in the very first webinar, actually, where he said that the, the challenge for him, how, how he encapsulated it, was triangulating different data points and that you can't really be confident until you build up uh, quite a web of, of, of different data points. Um, I think I was really interested by something you said way back when, and feel free to think about this if you want to, but in, in, in part of your opening comments, you said that you do this, you're, you're trying to generate usable, uh, actionable intelligence for any entities uh, that are concerned with the enforcement of UN Security Council uh, resolutions. So I'm really interested to find out how you get from your evidence to those entities, how they're picking up, how they're liaising with you, if that's a straightforward task for uh, a non-governmental think tank or, or not. Yeah, I don't know if you've got anything to say about that now. Or, yeah. 
Yeah, no, no, sure. Um, well, I guess it's a case of when we have, you know, public reporting, public reports uh, that we put out. And it's a case of, you know, we work on this uh, all, all day, all day, every day. And um, it's a case of, you know, knowing your, knowing your, your subject area. And, you know, me and my colleagues database a lot of information and, and track a lot of ships. So it's more of a case when we put out public reports, then we, we can, we hopefully, hopefully that's timely and that can be used in the, in the right sense enough for uh, people working in that space that they can, um, they can pick up on it and, and actually act on. Great, thank you very much. Um, so again, I think we've had this model before in previous uh, webinars. In, in the last webinar, we had Jamie Withorn from CNS, who feels like she's working on very similar uh, things to you in the sense that you make sure you publish things in the right places, and then they hopefully get picked up by the right people, which is a very uh, interesting thing that I think we might, we might want to talk about later, yes. But in the meantime, thank you to Joe. I'm going to hand over now to our second speaker, uh, Fea Lezhnevska. Uh, who's from SOAS. I think Fair had some difficulty connecting to the webinar space. So I'll just check Fair. Can you hear me? And are you here now? It looks like you're here. Yeah, I am here. I am. Hi, great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now the next thing is, can I share my screen? Let's, uh... Well, I had huge problems with that, so take your time. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, right. Um, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, just get this up, hopefully. Um, it should take a moment more. Hopefully we'll be there. I had it already, but... <laughs> While you're doing that, I'll just tell people that I'll post the links for the recordings of the first three webinars in case you're interested to, to see previous events uh, uh, on that. And I'll post them in the chat comment. In the okay, is that shared? We yes. Uh, if you if you now just run the sh the slideshow, we'll be able to see yeah. the big picture. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. Um. <laughs> right. Is it? You can see that. Actually, no. I've just got a, a, a plain white. There we go. Is that what you, is that what you've been intending to show? Yeah. No. Can you see the? Uh, can you see it now? Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, I'll I'll turn my video off just for. Right. No, not to take up too much time. Okay. Given that this. Um, so. Uh, I was invited really because I spoke to Henrietta about some work that I was doing um, regarding the digital earth, the concept of the digital digital earth, and how the. I'm so sorry to interrupt, but possible. we are seeing your entire screen. Um, so, sorry? Um, just we can still see your entire screen. Um, so, if you could just. Uh, only open up the slideshow in full screen mode. Um, otherwise, we see your documents and personal communications. And I just wanted to let you know. Uh, right, I don't know what's going wrong. I'll, I'll just... <laughs> uh, uh, sorry, I don't know what's happened here. Um, no worries at all. Um, you should be able to choose on when you're clicking on share screen. Um, you should normally have the option to choose what uh, type of document you would like to share. Sorry. Uh, sorry. I don't know what it, it's. It's on my other screen. Sorry. Uh, no worries at all. Uh, take your time. Do you want to go back to another speaker and Hamilton? Uh, thank you. I'll check um, uh, if, if he's available. Ola, would you be able to speak now? Uh, yes, I'm fine to go um, in the meantime. 
uh, to give a bit more time to sort out the screen sharing. Thank you very much, Ola. Um, Feo, could you please stop screen, sharing your screen now, please? Uh. There's a button saying stop share. All right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. Okay, <laughs> these things happen all the time, let's face it, yeah, we've all been there. <laughs> all good? Okay, I can see that there. Um, thank you. Um, I just want to make sure that you can hear me properly, Henrietta. I'm, oh, good. Okay. Um, so, thank you guys for joining us today. Um, I would like to start by thanking Henrietta, Dan, Julia, and the members of the Scrap Weapons team, who worked tirelessly on multiple fronts to convene critical discussions such as this one where we can meaningfully explore the possibilities within arms control and verification in particular. I'd also like to thank the panelists who have taken the time to participate in this webinar series. My, my remarks today will be centered on exploring the possibilities that are within reach. Possibilities that include the prospects of meaningfully incorporating some of the verification tools presented in this webinar series into existing and future arms control treaties and agreements. <clears throat> I must note that my remarks stem from creative thinking about the political implications of open source verification and not from the practitioner's point of view, um, such as Joseph's today. My remarks may also be focused more on nuclear arms control, but there are wider implications for conventional arms control and international security. So we are well aware of the concerns about the future of arms control. In recent times, some state parties have taken decisions to unilaterally withdraw from their political and legal obligations within international security treaties and agreements. Even though we face temporary setbacks, I believe the time is right to look ahead. The crises that are expected to accompany the end of arms control treaties should encourage states to reconsider bilateral and multilateral negotiated agreements in the future. Moving forward, I believe the arms control treaties will become more ambitious. We are now five ratifications away from the entry into force of the TPNW. This is bringing us closer to a paradigm shift where NPT state parties can no longer ignore the Article 6 obligation. Some nuclear weapon states and nuclear weapon sharing states would soon be forced to pursue further and rapid reductions in their nuclear weapon stockpiles in order to maintain their image as responsible nuclear weapon states and to also appease domestic public opinion. We might soon live in a world with lower numbers of total nuclear weapons, a world where the marginal benefits of increasing stockpiles might also tempt some states to do so but also a world where the connection between non-state entities and corporations to the financing and support of the nuclear weapons enterprise expands the type of activities that should be monitored. You just have to take a closer look at initiatives focused on divestment from nuclear weapons to envision or imagine some of the activities that will be under scrutiny. So when we look at New Start, for example, some of the preconditions demanded by the Trump administration follow this trend. Uh, US demands to count and limit warheads as opposed to delivery systems is a more challenging requirement. And this is because warheads are not as detectable as large missiles or bombers or other delivery platforms. This means that future inspection activities and notification requirements cannot be fulfilled with pen and paper reporting platforms. The information age is producing new ways to improve inspectors' ability to monitor the nuclear weapons enterprise. And I think it is time that we, at the very least, equip treaty inspectors with internet connected tools for geolocation uh, and for recording what they see and also for the transmission of analysis in real time. Over the past weeks, our discussions within this series have highlighted 
the pervasiveness and efficiency of existing open source verification tools. Nearly all of these tools have been fielded by NGOs and by non-governmental monitoring um, organizations. They include technologies already tracking illegal activities, uh, global transport networks, and systems for disaster tracking. So I think it's time that we recognize that these activities can be part of a global coordinated network that can complement and support interstate efforts at arms control. While other open source uh, methods can't really replace or reproduce the scope of internationally negotiated verification regimes, other open source investigative work can in some instances be incorporated into the legal regimes that we deal with today. In many cases, open source analysts' local knowledge gives them access to more detailed social and geographical contextual information. On top of this, many open source verification projects are transparent in their methodologies. Data and findings and contextual information means that their work is also open to scrutiny, evaluation, and authentication. So one of the synergies I've identified throughout the uh, verification series is the potential to leverage smartphone technologies to improve old techniques reliant on ground-based visual observation, especially in treaty reliance efforts. So at the moment, we largely have two means of verification. We have national technical means of verification and official on-site inspection activities. This means have been treated as verification extremities. But in the information age, I believe there can be a third middle ground means. To be clear, national technical means are monitoring techniques used to verify adherence to international treaties and agreements. Uh, these include space-based satellites, reconnaissance planes, radar systems, seismic intelligence, um, and other forms of high-tech systems that are used mainly by states, international organizations, but also big tech corporations. On the other hand, we have official on-site inspection activities with predetermined procedures and methods of inspection. These activities are also designated to predetermined expert delegations. So while NTMs and national technical means allow for more frequent, almost permanent verification of treaty compliance, on-site inspections allow for more detailed appraisal of compliance on a more periodic basis. And there are political benefits for both of these forms of verification in isolation. Historically, NTMs have focused on missile and nuclear weapons counter-proliferation activities, but at its core, the general principles hold for verification of treaties that counter chemical and biological weapons, but also other treaties concerned with the protection of human rights and the laws of armed conflict. We now have the means to field ground-based visual observation systems with characteristics borrowed from NTMs and on-site inspections. So with the know-how of verification NGOs and the buy-in of interested publics, such a system can be launched on the basis of existing technology. So let's imagine an arms control treaty that permits national technical means on one hand, official on-site inspections on the other hand, but also non-state ground-based visual observations covering the middle ground. We can have minimally intrusive on-site observation procedures carried out by locally based inspectors trained to use handheld technologies that transmit specific SIGINT related to a specific treaty. These observations can be carried out on a reasonably periodic basis, which means more frequently than on-site inspections, but less frequently than NTMs. And the data gathered from these observations can be electronically transmitted to treaty compliance monitoring systems. Now this approach will allow us not only to tailor and limit the number of un official on-site inspections, but it also offers us better contextual understanding than what NTMs currently permit. Now, I agree that thinking about such a system requires more critical and sustained consideration, but this example only serves to illustrate what is possible if we take a fresh approach. 
treaty compliance can take on new forms that are much more effective and better suited to the age of Google Earth. Now, there are many ethical, political, technical considerations, um, and I invite the audience to discuss this further in the breakout session and in the Q&A. Um, thank you very much, and over to you, Henrietta. Uh, thank you, Ola. What a brilliant uh, encapsulation of all sorts of ways that the uh, uh, open source projects, open source research projects that we've been thinking about could be applied. So right at the start of your talk, you're pointing out that there are some really deep, entrenched uh, problems with global governance at the moment. Uh, and there are also some signs of optimism with, you mentioned the treaty prohibiting nuclear weapons as one of them, the, the, the increasing numbers of people joining that treaty. Um, and of course, one of the criticisms leveled at that treaty is its possible verification <laughs> provisions. Um, and, and you pointed out, you kind of pointed that there might be a way of joining up different systems, of having the national technical means, the government's own systems for checking on each other with the treaty-based systems, which include uh, on-site inspections, and then maybe open source stuff can help with that. So that kind of relates to the question I was really trying to ask Joe earlier, the sense that he's collecting data, there's a lot of data being collected, and then how does that data get to be applied uh, globally uh, to, to, to help with things? So uh, I, I would like to kind of follow up on a whole um, bunch of these things, but what I am going to ask you <laughs> about Ola in the first instance is, you mentioned, you, you mentioned a vision of, could this be part of a global coordinated network? So we've heard from people cited in many different places in the world, using many different methodologies. Is there some sort of way to, uh, to coordinate these activities? And I wonder, have you, have you thought at all about this? Like, like Joe, if I'm putting you on the spot and you want more time to think about this, please, please feel free to pass on it. But have you thought of how systems could be uh, coordinated or joined up? in any way? Um, yes, I haven't really had sustained thoughts on how to actually join up and create this global network, but there are two preliminary uh, considerations that I've, I've been able to think up. Um, so the first is a global network or a global federation um, of made up of these NGOs and um, expert organizations that already deal with the tools and methods of open source verification. Now, a lot of these organizations carry out functions um, in different contexts, and they also use different tools and methodologies. Um, but much like this convenient forum, I believe that there's enough information exchange and some standardization of uh, widely used techniques that we can have a global system on the basis um, or on the backbone of this constellation of organizations. Um, in more practical terms, the second format that I've, I've thought of is one that's based on treaties, um, uh, treaties that cover different contexts. So in this particular format, um, what I think could be feasible in the medium and long-term future is that recognized organizations, recognized experts uh, can be part of the actual implementation or enforcement regime of a particular treaty, wherein there's a legal provision for observation uh, missions, which aren't as stringent as official you know, on-site inspections, that are designated to these non-state entities. Um, and I think one way in which uh, the information produced by these observations um, can be standardized is actually by having a direct line of communication between these observation missions and uh, the depository of treaty or the central treaty uh, enforcement body. So just to summarize, the first would be a global constellation constellation of organizations um, and NGOs on the basis of expertise and techniques. But the second would be uh, different global networks centered around treaties and their enforcement cycles, if that makes any sense. Yeah, that makes total sense. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, I'm aware in our audience today, we have people that have been involved in the design of international treaty frameworks and the design and the implementation. So it'd be very interesting if anybody wants to step in with any experiences of how that might work, uh, how uh, a 
uh, well, and also Joe, actually, seeing as you're one of these uh, verification practitioners, as it were, uh, the extent to which it's possible to develop federations, loose coordination channels between NGOs involved in different aspects of open source verification, um, and whether that's already happening, in fact, and also the uh, the challenge of getting those findings into people implementing treaty regimes if that's possible if it's desirable what would that look like yeah anyway thank you very much Olamide Samuel um, I'm now going to invite Faya Lezhnevska to uh, try and share her screen again um, so if we can can have a go at that thank you Great, Faye. I can see your screen now and I've unmuted you, so uh, I think you're good to go. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent, right. Well, thank you again, um, Henrietta, for uh, inviting me to contribute to this webinar. Um, I think I'd, I'm taking more of a uh, historic and, and somewhat uh, um, bigger oversight uh, to the issues by looking at the geopolitical dimensions regarding the, um, the critical infrastructure that's been established to uh, deliver both open source and uh, closed data systems. And, and the, the consequences potentially of that uh, as we move forward. I'm focusing on a concept called Digital Earth. Um, Digital Earth has been presented as a a benign, apolitical concept, um, uh, but in many ways it, it really is not, and I'll explain why. Uh, it was Al Gore that really coined the term Digital Earth. Uh, he coined it at a time when he was involved with the negotiations for the Kyoto Protocol uh, to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. It was very much off his thinking that this was a means by which we could uh, globally come together and manage um, global problems, particularly relating to the environment. But he was at the time the uh, um, uh, deputy, uh, the uh, vice president to in the Clinton administration, which uh, at that time had. Uh, through the introduction of intellectual property law, basically commercialized, opened up the competitive environment for what we see coming later as the international uh, big tech industries from, from the US. And we also saw the standardization through ICANN. So it's very much a post-Cold War, um, very US dominated idea that was furnished by technology and values by uh, from the West. So that's how digital earth kind of emerged. Well, what's been interesting about the idea is it's been taken up the most, perhaps vigorously within China. Um, and uh, the International Society for Digital Earth was formed in Beijing in 2006. And its mission statement is like non-political, non-governmental, not-for-profit, uh, and you know, again, being apolitical, uh, very neutral, really about achieving these these uh, these goals, collective hu human goals. You know, uh, twenty well, uh, thirteen years later, in the uh, Florence Declaration agreed last year, there's a real recognition that. We're not talking. We aren't. We're not talking about just satellites. We're not talking about uh, observation and gathering data from geo satellites. The digital Earth, because of the um, advances in technologies, we are talking about the Internet of Things. Um, obviously, that interlinked with five G. So you have a a really complex infrastructure which is not around the Earth, but embedded in the earth and on people with you know uh, various technologies that people carry um, with their every day and it's interesting you know that Ola was saying you know people are using telephone uh, their mobile phones to 
the citizen science. This has been a really big part of uh, the idea of empowering civil society to be part of, of digital earth, to be responsible and contribute to um, achieving the goal of a sustainably managed world. It came at a time as well of the digital earth when we have the idea of the Anthropocene and uh, that we have a bad Anthropocene, the big impacts on uh, the global environment with ever increasing uh, threats to breaching planetary boundaries. And in increasingly we see the digital earth being deployed as a concept by uh, big technology companies and by governments alike and academics as a means by which we gather enough data to address the problems that we're faced with. So for example, uh, the FAO Google Earth map, now that was launched uh, just this month. Um, Google have been working with UN agencies and uh, particularly Western environmental organizations. Uh, for example, in 2014, Google worked with the World Resource Initiative Institute, rather, um, to develop the uh, Forest Watch that now has moved on to becoming uh, Natural Resource Watch. Um, so huge amounts of uh, free data, open data to observe and track and trace and manage uh, to potentially develop more policy on environmental governance. And as we see in the Florence Declaration, the link is also made to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, the UN uh, Environment Programme has launched a significant programme around uh, gathering data, working with open source data, working with um, the various citizen organisations, academics. So there's an enormous emphasis on uh, data gathering, using new technologies as part of Digital Earth to achieve the objectives of the Sustainable Development Goals, but also other multilateral environmental agreements, particularly the uh, Paris Agreement, uh, obviously like tracking uh, carbon emissions, smart cities, uh, but we also have other land or, um, or orientated ones like the this one for the, the Earth map, which is the FAO are particularly keen to look at how we can uh, use digital technologies to improve efficiency in food systems. Now, behind this, uh, you know, there's again, you have Google, and there's a quote here by Rebecca Moore, which basically says, we're just providing the service. We're only providing a service so that the FAO can do its job. Um, and again, that kind of benign perspective of the technology behind the, the service provision. Uh, which is to facilitate the uh, open source gathering of data. There's very li little kind of recognition of the relationship uh, between the physical infrastructure, uh, the government relationship between Google and other platforms, providers, and there is very little appreciation of the tensions between different service providers. So, Let's go back to China. Uh, China has ambitions similarly around digital earth, but if you, if you go back to the uh, establishment of the International Society for Digital Earth, the idea is very much like it's a global uh, collaboratory approach. But you see here with the uh, Chinese Academy establishing the digital earth under information Silk Road, there are territorial uh, ambitions as well about controlling uh, access to data uh, because access to data regarding uh, natural resources, um, near neighbor um, supply chains is vital for the continuation of a sustainable China. So it's no wonder that the new digital earth 
um, is linked up to also the global satellite navigation system, BEDO2, which has already been linked in with uh, surrounding uh, countries in the, um, to, to China and is, is established specifically to compete with the GPS uh, of the US. And one of the interesting things, of course, is that this is a, a real um, challenge to the original establishment and infrastructure of the internet from um, the early 1990s and that which was under ICANN, the standardization body um, that the US had backed up until it um, became non-international and nationally orientated in 2016. So what, um, what we're seeing, and I mean, what I'm trying to sort of communicate is that essentially we have emerging uh, territories over the digital earth uh, infrastructure. Uh, and that infrastructure is both physical in terms of the economics and, and the production of the technology. It's about capturing the economic value of the data and controlling those territories where you hold that data and who controls that. And there is certainly a division between China and America. And Europe is in there as well. Um, I haven't spoken about Europe and I don't feel I have the time. What I want to just speculate over in the, the, the coming decade is the um, China will in the coming decade remain with the same uh, political authority uh, with the same uh, premier, uh, Xi Jinping, who has a particular vision. America will not uh, have the same person in power. Uh, so the what we can see, I expect, is that digital earth will be increasingly dominated by a perspective of and the physical infrastructure of China. Um, China has really ramped up and it only saw, we saw yesterday, 2060, as their zero emissions target. That will have a planetary impact uh, in terms of trade, uh, in terms of relations, and they underscore that with their ambitions around digital technologies, uh, economically um, and in terms of data gathering. China is also the one of the main investors in, in the key technologies for advancing the digital earth. Um, and obviously within an increasingly insecure environment, um, whoever can deliver a more sustained and a reliable system is going to have much more um, leverage internationally, politically. Uh, and my bet is on China uh, out of the two at the moment. So um, yeah, thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Faya. Um, uh, maybe if you stop sharing your screen now, please, um, and we'll come back to the plenary. Um, I think that was a really interesting compliment to the sorts of issues that Ola was raising. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, so Ola, in his, uh, in his recognition that in the uh, sorts of open source investigations we've been looking at in these webinars, he, he could see the nascent qualities um, of a global system for tracking weapons that could maybe either sit entirely in the NGO community or maybe somehow there could be some sort of arrangements for using it within the bigger set of treaty regimes against weapons uh, uh, in different forms. Um, what you pointed out for, for definitely seems to me as though that system of collecting open source stuff and using it globally sort of is there in this idea of digital earth. They've kind of worked out some of the mechanisms. There's UN agencies using uh, digital data in this way and that it maybe isn't the panacea we'd be reaching to. And, and uh, if, if we're thinking about global systems, care needs to be taken about how they work, who's doing it, who can use it, who owns it. Um, uh, uh, not if I've, if I've got that right so far. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, great, okay. Um, so I guess my question to you is, um, uh, well, just that, uh, do, you, do you think, 
um, there can be any sort of regulations for who's doing it and, and controls on, on, on how the data is used. Is it too late for Digital Earth uh, already or, 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 or can anything be done to mitigate the sort of risks you highlighted? I think uh, one of the really one of the big difficulties about any of these conversations um, and it, Digital Earth doesn't really get talked about in that context very much. You generally get conversations about regulation of um, uh, particular aspects like AI. There's a lot of focus on AI at the moment. Um, how we're going to regulate uh, the Internet of Things. Um, continuing discussions around privacy, uh, online privacy. We don't think about the infrastructure of the digital earth collectively. Um, and I think a much more collective focus is needed um, because if you only focus on, um, on particular aspects, like you know how data is used and data privacy and stuff, you're not focusing on like the actual security systems behind it, how those systems are, are linked up with um, other parts of the, um, the infrastructure. I think there's a, a real need to understand that da the digital earth concept is a meta infrastructure upon which other infrastructures are absolutely dependent. And therefore, the insecurities, it multiplies the vulnerabilities and insecurities uh, for uh, undermining and attacking those. So re increased reliance on them um, becomes really problematic. And I, I mean, I, I was listening to Ola's ideal I, so suggestions about treaties and monitoring and this and that. Uh, and I, I, so, you know, I would really hesitate around, you know, there's some really significant questions around um, particularly the security of the systems, how systems interface, interoperability between US, Chinese, European, um, within different sectors, all, all these things. So, yeah. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you for that word. Well, those words of caution. Um, it's all really interesting. I'm just going to point out to everybody that the time is now three. And so we're now officially at the optional breakout session. Um, so I do hope everybody will jump in with any observations or comments or questions about this. Um, I think, Faya, it's, it's very interesting that you raise this point. I'm also mindful, going back to Ola's talk, that the international community in all sorts of contexts has managed to develop very delicate balancing acts in the verification regimes that are attached to international treaties outlawing different weapon systems. Um, so uh, in the traditional concept of verification, it's tied to an international treaty and there are very clear systems for doing the sorts of things you, you talk about. There's very clear systems about what people can look at, when they can look at it, uh, how the data is stored, how information is stored, how they, how they can communicate with different people and who's doing it. So it is possible to set up systems uh, that address complicated information environments. What concerns me, and I want to go back to Joe here as well, um, if that's possible, is he here? Oh no, is he gone? <laughs> um, what, no, no, what's interesting, here. oh yeah, sorry, I couldn't see you in the list of people. Hi Joe. Um, um, I, I'm interested to know how that feels to you as an open source researcher because uh, in the past webinars, the people you've talked to, there's been a sense of uh, uh, small non-governmental groups collecting information in a very progressive uh, uh, sort of way, wanting to help make a difference to, to uh, global governance uh, in a very um, positive way. Um, so does this talk about joining up make you feel nervous? Does it feel possible to be thinking along the lines that they just, um, outlined about if it's possible to set up systems where you are truly interoperable or is it better to do it how you're doing it now quite independent uh, isolated groups um, relying a bit on happenstance about what you happen to be looking for or not uh, does that make sense to you joe uh, yeah it's, it's definitely an interesting question not and not one if i'm honest i've thought about it uh, uh, a lot um, sure. In terms of in terms of the open source collection we have at the minute, I still I think we're still relatively in the infancy of you know uh, 
collecting this information using open sources, right? So it's still developing and we don't really know where it's going to end and we don't really know how you know it's going to be in the next couple of years, let alone um, forever in the future. So I, I'm not actually, I don't actually know. I mean, I'm, that's a good question. I would definitely go away and think. No, no. That. So that's, that's great, isn't it? And you said right in your talk, this sense that the, there's only going to be more of this stuff. Whatever, what, um, whatever we're, we're uh, thinking about now is going to get cheaper, it's going to get easier, there's going to be more people doing it. Um, so in a previous webinar, one of the speakers did mention maybe there was standards uh, or, or joined up us in that way about, about best practice for open source research. Um, I noticed that um, uh, uh, Sergei Batsanov has asked uh, to, to speak and I'd be very happy to hand the floor to him if he's still here. Hi, yes, there you are. I'm trying to unmute you. Yes, there you are unmuted. Uh, I've done that, thank you. Thank um, you. Do you hear me now? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, first of all, thank you. It's a very interesting discussion. I'm sorry, really sorry, I could not join you earlier. I mean, for your previous webinars. Uh, so maybe uh, I'm therefore I'm at the risk of saying something that uh, had been said earlier, uh, but nevertheless I'm not really trying to uh, comment on any particular presentations uh, made uh, today, uh, but of course uh, my thoughts kind of were born when I was listening to those presentations. Uh, and uh, not in a very systemic way. Let me uh, share some of the observations. Now, if we take verification of arms uh, control treaties and uh, in a more general sense, behavior of uh, players, players concerned, uh, it's not a secret that to a large degree, with the strict uh, verification rules and procedures, without uh, them, um, a major actor or major group of uh, shareholders, so to say, are the intelligence communities uh, of, the, of, of, again, leading countries. Now, uh, usually, the, as the current situation um, shows, and at least as uh, I can understand it, they have no particular problem of uh, gathering, catching uh, tons or megatons of information of different bits and pieces. Where uh, it becomes more difficult uh, is when they start uh, analyzing this information, sorting it out. And there they have um, several choices, uh, not mutually excluding ones. One is to outsource the information analysis to some private uh, companies. And, and that is happening. Uh, another one, uh, and this is what we are discussing now, uh, is civil society, so they may be tempted to outsource that process to civil society. Uh, exactly to do what we are discussing now. And the third uh, option is to outsource the whole process to artificial intelligence, sort of. Um, that, uh, as far as civil society is concerned, that does create certain risks. Um, now, there were a couple of uh, very good uh, and appropriate mentioning of infrastructure uh, for this and who controls it, who owns it. Uh, I think it, uh, it will become a very, very pertinent element. Uh, equally, what is important, uh, in my view, is actually uh, who pays for that. An arms control regime, who decides uh, who should be accredited and who should not be accredited. 
And in that, uh, taking into account these two uh, questions, sort of, uh, I think we should also look at how this, play, this is playing out in existing verification regimes. Uh, pain. Um, now, one of the organizations that I am following rather um, closely is the IAEA. And um, there is IAEA budget when, uh, including for the application of safeguards, there are certain rules how the balance has to be maintained between uh, safeguards and other activities like uh, the IAEA activities in the promotion of the peaceful uh, uses of nuclear energy and nuclear science and so on and so forth. Uh, the latter is, to a large degree, to a significant degree, financed by voluntary contributions by states. And I had several discussions, uh, including with uh, directors uh, general of the IEA, including with deputy directors general responsible for safeguards, uh, where I was asking this question, to what extent uh, the safeguards, which is verification activity of the agency, uh, can be financed, especially when you have a surge in activity, like uh, the agency had to do uh, after, the, after it was given both rights and obligations to help verify the JCPOA provisions, uh, nuclear deal with Iran. So is there a place for voluntary contributions for that? And the answer I was receiving every time was categor categorically no. Because when it comes to uh, collecting data on the basis of which you decide whether somebody is a good guy or maybe not so good guy, uh, there should be no place for voluntary contributions from states. Uh, the other example is another organization which I know perhaps even better than the IAEA, uh, that is OPCW. And in the OPCW, of course, uh, there, is, there are several projects uh, related to Syria. And uh, there you have uh, a lot of uh, voluntary contributions, specifically by states who, for their own reasons, I'm not going to discuss whether it's correct or not, uh, specifically do not like uh, the current president of Syria and who think that um, he should go away. Now, I find it uh, a rather, let's say, worrisome sign that uh, such activity can be financed by uh, countries with a clear and ambiguous political position uh, regarding the country which is being inspected. Uh, and the question in my mind is then how to um, take care of the fact that uh, the financing of, uh, let's say, NGO surveillance, whatever verification activities, uh, could avoid falling into that trap. The other thing is, and this is what came to my mind uh, when listening to the first presentation, uh, Korea, how we, North Korea rather, how we follow various illegitimate activities of North Korea. North Korea in that sense may be an easier uh, example because there are numerous decisions and resolutions uh, by the UN Security Council focusing on that country and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, still, uh, what about other countries? Uh, do we, are we going also to track everybody's uh, illegitimate activities? And there are a lot of illegitimate activities by a number of other countries belonging to different political groupings, alliances, uh, temporary alliances, permanent alliances, and so on and so forth. Just look what is happening to uh, the supply of uh, weapons and sometimes fighters uh, 
to influence the outcome of the war in, in Libya today. Now, how would that work and how would that be financed? Uh, that's uh, another question. Um, and also, what approach in general should uh, such uh, additional, let's say, verification activity take? Uh, adversarial or something, let's say, uh, less than that? How uh, you can ensure that um, the process itself is not corrupt due to uh, or is uh, corruption resistant due to obvious uh, or very possible uh, wishes to use that process as well and now everything is being weaponized in this world unfortunately uh, to avoid being weaponized, uh, not in the sense that it, it can be turned into a missile, but weaponized in terms of waging a global um, or regional, whatever, propaganda war. Thank uh, you. Yeah, yeah. sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, yes, let me um, just see, but I think I've more or less uh, said what I had to say. Yeah, the question is very much about trust and the current mistrust in, in the real world around us, uh, which unfortunately mistrust is getting stronger, deeper and ever more pervasive. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sergey, and I'm sorry that I interrupted you prematurely uh, just then. <laughs> yeah. um, so, you know, this is really fascinating, bringing your experiences to some of the things that have been raised uh, today. Uh, I really picked up uh, through your comments this sense that there are interrelated sort of vulnerabilities with any verification system. Um, some of them are to do with the practicalities of how that's set up, which relates very strongly to what Fair, which what Fair was talking about earlier. And I, uh, you, you raised the point about who pays for it. The, the fact of how it operates could be subject to some sort of subversion and leaving it up to voluntary contributions <laughs> it, it is, is problematic. And then this sense of who chooses what's being looked at? Okay, North Korea is something that's being watched at the moment, but who gets to choose the other things? Um, it feels to me as though the open source research projects we've been showcasing might be one way round some of these vulnerabilities in that you have lots of independent, uh, separate but overlapping groups that are self-financing, uh, which is something we didn't talk to Joe about, um, but that there, there are redundancies in the information collection and in, in how they operate. Um, I'm not quite sure if it, if it addresses the ethics question that you raised, because I am aware that uh, the sort of people that we've been speaking to are from majority uh, 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 Western perspectives, I'd say. Um, so I'm not sure. I think that is a real point that needs to be explored in much more depth. Um, I'm aware that Dan Plesh wants to come in now. Uh, and I had a comment um, earlier on from somebody saying, um, uh, that we don't just need to be watching states proliferating. There's increased risks of non-state actors getting devastating weapon systems and uh, that that needs to be kept an eye on too. Uh, but thank you. Over to you, Dan. I think this has been a, a, a tremendous, a remarkable um, series of webinars and I think we'll continue them and develop them. I think part of the premise for all of this from perspective of the scrap project was that on the one hand you have let us say an educated world that thinks it's viable and sensible to uh, monitor the world's greenhouse gas emissions and to organize to change the whole of industrial society to deal with that problem but very largely that entire community and the people around it uh, when they think about if they think at all about the world's weaponry uh, think about it as um, uh, too hot to handle, too hard to think about, you know, a, a very secret, difficult world and not helped by the, the blizzard of acronyms uh, in, our, in our communities. Um, and we also know, if we stop to think that uh, while there are all sorts of regimes and organisations 
dealing with instruction or focused on uh, what in I used to used to be called when I was growing up low intensity conflict in in Mali um, and parts of Syria and the Middle East, for example, uh, and we've had incredibly in, informed presentations from people engaged in these two different worlds. Um, since the decay of the European arms control agreements of the 1990s, there's really absolutely nothing in the NGO field or the official world dealing with the major armaments of the world's armies, navies and air forces. And yet this is where trillions of dollars are being spent. And I think what I feel from this webinar series is that we're getting towards a, a process where we can start to say, well, if the political will was there uh, and to, have to help generate the political will, we can uh, look to uh, bring together network, use examples, the different components where people have been coming from to our webinars, but also, uh, if that's the kind of practical vision, but also to communicate with that, let's say, that, that wider educated world to say, actually, um, not just in theory, but in practice, uh, global weapons governance is actually a, a, pr a practical proposition. Here's how. And I think that given the uh, extremely dangerous trends that we don't have to restate at the moment in uh, geopolitics and weapons production, that has, I think, huge potential. And I'm just very heartened um, by the individual contributions and, and the quality um, of the different contributions that we've had over recent weeks and months. That's all I want to say, really. I think it's been tremendous and uh, there are lots of ways forward, uh, but it's very encouraging for us to think about how we might engage. Great, thank you very much, Dan. I've had, uh, Sergey wants to come, come back on that briefly, and then Faya wants to say something, I think, and then I'll invite uh, Ola also to come back. I know Joe has to run quite quite quickly, um, so I'll, I'll very quickly uh, invite Joe to say anything, but just uh, uh, leave if you need to. Uh, no, uh, Joe's got... Uh, oh, sorry, go. yeah, yeah. I, just, no, I just want to say thank you very much for uh, inviting the sessions, and these have been extremely useful and the people that have been on them um it's been great to have them all in one place so i think it's been really great um thank you and thank you anyone but if anyone wants to message me about other work then please do and um thanks again well thank you very much for being part of it and i look forward to future uh, interactions um so sergey over to you for a response to dan's point <laughs> uh yeah uh, am i unmuted yes yeah good a uh, couple of things. First, it was not my intention to actually criticize or to take an issue with anything said uh, by the presenters, nor in a more general way to try to um, throw doubts about the, uh, the whole exercise. Uh, simply to point out that there are issues that uh, at least require certain uh, cautions, caution and a thoughtful approach. And those issues, I think, are pushing me, at least in my, or my mind, towards suggesting that there should be some uh, difference, at least at the beginning, uh, at the introductory phase as to the weight of what is coming from, uh, let's say, the civil society observation capabilities and uh, more traditionally uh, from more traditional sources. Then, uh, and I cannot really specify it, uh, perhaps subject-wise, uh, in terms of what is being monitored, what is being observed, uh, there are, um, say, issues or limitations or prohibitions where uh, all those dangers which I mentioned may be much more pronounced. And there are things, uh, there are areas where they are less pronounced. And maybe at the beginning it would be useful to concentrate on the latter. 
That is, uh, that when you discover something, um, and that something is kind of bad, the impact of that would not necessarily be dramatic and uh, cannot be easily weaponized in the negative sense. That there is, uh, that the result would be that there is something that we should look at again, more attentively, maybe from another angle, both physically and uh, literally and uh, in theory, um, and come to uh, an explanation. Uh, and it also seems to me that, and actually that applies not only, not only to the raw, well, to the actual, actual mechanical data, uh, but um, to the interpretation. I remember uh, that you uh, listened to a very interesting presentation by uh, Richard Guthrie. Uh, and that was about the yellow rain in Southeast Asia and in Afghanistan. And it took a lot of time actually for researchers after all those events uh, to uh, sort it out and to find the real explanation of that phenomenon. Uh, which leads me to think that um, uh, there should be some, uh, let's say, assessment body that uh, may be tasked to uh, address the information coming from the open source. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sergey. Uh, yes, very interesting uh, and relates to a big question about verification that's been there for as long as <laughs> I've thought about these things. This question after detection, what? What happens when you find some bit of information that implies something bad has happened? And what you're saying is the open source stuff needs to be very wary uh, about the claims it makes, I think, and that the, the data, rather than triggering some sort of automatic responses, that uh, it triggers a set of authentication and follow-up uh, information and research gathering sort of uh, activities. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Faye, you wanted to come in on this. Yeah, I was just um, sort of jogged by something that Dan said, um, uh, the kind of like the separation of communities uh, and focus on, uh, you know, uh, verification around uh, uh, the um, weapons of mass destruction and verification of um, environmental uh, degradation for multilateral environmental agreements, either to uh, inform uh, policy and, and lobbying or to inform enforcement and compliance. Uh, and I, I was reading a um, really interesting book recently just published called Dark Skies by a guy called Dudney. <laughs> uh, and it talked a lot around how the space project, you have different communities within the space project and the space project being all of that infrastructure I spoke about for the digital earth uh, and how it's you have the military side of it you have the protecting the planet earth side of it um, and often as Dan says they're not communicating with each other but using similar tools and increasingly those tools can be used for both positive and negative purposes so something that I've been looking at is the use of uh, surveillance technologies um, and how they're being employed to undermine the activism of in, uh, uh, indigenous peoples and uh, uh, displaced peoples in, in, in the Amazon region. Uh, so this is the use by the state of everyday technologies, which are for surveillance and but there's similar technologies that the communities themselves are using to surveil 
the um, the loggers and the companies and the, the, the breaches by by the local authority, the, the police. So w there's an interesting kind of interplay about the technologies that make up all of this infrastructure increasingly become affordable, usable by anybody. And what an, an idea by uh, this guy, uh, Jaris Groves of sustainable warfare, that we just sustainably manage warfare through the use of all these technologies disrupting and and causing upset around the world um and i think sort of examples that it's a shame that uh the rusi uh, john burns are gone there's a rusi example of you know shipping where you can easily disrupt shipping through getting into tracking devices and moving them off course uh by uh sending the wrong information so there's so lots of uh, aspects that unpick about, but I think Dan's absolutely right. Getting different communities together to start to see how what's going in one community is actually really very similar, and things could be learned. I mean, in many ways, I'm very glad that you invited me on because you know I am not a weapons of mass destruction surveillance expert. I, my interest came from looking at uh, survey um, tracking illegal logging. But it, you know, there's lots of interest there. But yeah, yeah. Thank you, Faya, and and uh, we're delighted to have you. It's not just fixed to weapon systems these sets of webinars because we're yeah. absolutely aware that there are synergies and overlaps in different uh, monitoring uh, activities. Um, so it's, it's great to have you and and to explore some of these implications. And you raise yet another set of ethical conundrums. This kind of set, this idea about surveillance technologies in general. Uh, uh, going into ethically very complicated spaces of privacy or subversion or or controlling a political narrative in all sorts of ways that weren't necessarily intended. Uh, so we're getting very close to 3.30. So I'm going to start winding it all up. And uh, before I close it all down, I want to give Ola a chance to come back uh, on, on some of the com uh, comments that have been relevant to his talk and, and to reflect on the webinar as a whole. Thanks, Ola. Thank you very much, Harriet. I'll try to be as brief as possible. Um, <clears throat> I, I would like to thank everyone for the very insightful comments made and feedback um, to some of the issues um, that have been raised in this webinar. Um, I must note that the, the thrust of my contribution today was to inspire creative thinking around um, much established uh, arms control uh, regimes and treaties um, and quite a number of these creative solutions are rather ambitious um, and also um, are not entirely implementable in the short term but it's definitely positive that we begin to start looking at what capabilities exist and how they can meaningfully enhance even piecemeal uh, meaningfully enhance existing um, arms control regimes um, I'd like to leave uh, the viewers with uh, a specific thought on the possible application of uh, ground-based uh, visual observation systems, um, wherein we think about uh, deploying or imagining uh, the deployment of these ground-based observation systems um, in less complicated theatres. So if we're looking at bilateral arms control agreements, for example, the issues uh, with regards to financing, um, the issues with regards to technology deployed and the interoperability of these technologies um, would be less disruptive uh, to progress. So really, if we're thinking about differentiated contexts, um, whether it's in a bilateral fashion, focused on arms control, for example, these contributions become a little bit more uh, feasible and realistic. And of course, on the basis of best practice that has to be you know, negotiated uh, between state parties, we might be able to develop a toolkit that can then be scaled up or deployed in wider multilateral uh, legal agreements and treaties. But thank you very much. Uh, over to you, Henrietta. Thank you, Ola. And I think that's a really important point and follows really neatly from the sort of things that Sergey uh, and everybody was talking about actually, this sense that negotiated treaties each have very particular 
verification requirements and verification needs and a sense that the open source stuff can be much more flexible uh, than the negotiated regimes and maybe there's opportunities to marry some of those up um, and and definitely you pose a really useful question to the whole series this this bigger picture thing can open source research that is happening all around the place in many different contexts can it be harnessed uh, to better use within systems of global governance and if so how what does that look like uh, and Faye, you've done a really good job of keeping us grounded of, <laughs> hang on a minute, you need to watch out for these sorts of things. Um, so it's just left now to say thank you very much, everybody, for being here and being part of this uh, great uh, discussion. Um, it's given me loads to think about. We have another webinar in a couple of weeks um, with some different uh, open source experts. Um, I'd be very happy to see you all there again. Um, and in the meantime, um, Look out for the recording, which will be coming through in a couple of days. Thank you very much and hope you have a great rest of your days. Bye.